Okay, shall we start? First of all, it's great to see you all guys. Today we have a representation from different cultures. So we have representative from South Africa, from Lithuania, Sasha. We have Vlad from Canada, pretty much international company. Core of congregation is here and I'm happy to see you all guys. So we'll start today with the uh, action and consequences. As we all know that our Taoist Bible, Tao Te Ching, it's a book of warnings. That's what it is. How to build path to content life. So we should know the obstacles. And uh, by seeing obstacles, we should see the problems. So the Tao Te Ching and another say Chuang Tse, who illustrate postulates of Tao Te Ching, Lao Tse postulates, during beautiful and beautiful novels. So that's, that's what we'll ask, the warnings of actions and consequences. Uh, we'll touch many facets of, of Tao. Tao is like a diamond. I just want to remind again, the different facets touch each other. So again, if it's gonna sound like a little bit repetition here, or it's like, oh, we spoke about that, it's not really. It's a, we're just touching the different facets of the Tao, we touch each other. So actions and consequences, again. One of the first questions when usually I ask people who I work as a, as a life coach, where I would, do you know yourself? That's the first question. The person usually very confused when I ask the questions. Now, of course I know myself. What does it mean you know yourself? Do you understand, for instance, your limitations? How's your expectations? We constantly will come back to these two things, expectations and limitations. That's what it is. Can you restrain your emotions in another thing? As, as, as I said in our essay, that if, if we could teach children from childhood to restrain emotions, our prisons would be empty. It's, it's a very important thing. In other words, can you pay attention to symptoms of situations, common problem or pro problems, common danger? Do you realize your own actually pluses and minuses? Again, what can you do, what you cannot do? I remember the great words of a friend of mine, police officer, who said, in our department, we say, there's no victims, only volunteers. So in other words, do you have some kind of idea of alertness? Are you alert enough to see coming danger? Are you intelligent enough to de-escalate problems when it starts? So it's all consequences. And if actions correct, consequences correct. Right consequences, it's one more step to contentment. Bad actual consequences, one more step to disaster. That's what we'll discuss today with the more details. First of all, we'll start again for expectations of the reality of life. How well we adjust ourselves to reality. Can we see reality? Of course, it's impossible to see reality of life totally clear, but we should do our best. We should walk to the reality and say as close as possible. So, Peter, Peter will enlighten us. Peter Africano, please. Those who dream of the banquet wake to lamentation and sorrow. Those who dream of lamentation and sorrow wake to join the hunt. So what this basically means is uh, if what, what Master was saying is if you want to be content in life, uh, you need to have the, the right expectations. And these expectations, of course, need to align with reality. Once you uh, have the correct expectations, then this 
perspective will create the correct actions and consequences. In reality, nature is unkind. And since we are all part of nature, uh, we need to abide by all its uh, rules. In nature, uh, it is either hunter or prey, and it's clearly defined. Animals have, have no choice in their decision of, of what to be. We do have a choice. Uh, with the animals, for example, we always use the example that the, the tiger cannot become a vegetarian. Because we have a choice, we need to, to actively uh, fight for life. We must understand our limitations and re reject any unrealistic expectations that we have. As humans, we, we instinctively understand physical limitations, like we can't lift a car or jump over a building, but we, we have to work to uh, appreciate our, our limits and adjust our, our lifestyles accordingly. And once we've achieved that, then we can we can move on and live every day as our last. Great. Everything is excellent. Thanks so much, Peter. Those who dream of the banquet wake to lamentation and sorrow. Those who dream of lamentation and sorrow wake to join the hunt. That's it. Great. Thank you. That's that's that's, that's a great words of John there. Yeah. It's Again, if expectations of the banquet, then wake up to limitation and sorrow. That's what it is. Yeah. If your expectations are correct, join the hunt. Become a hunter. A lot of times uh, in a high civilized society, uh, like an uh, American culture uh, or, or Western Europe, the, the breach between uh, consequences and actions, it almost doesn't exist because everything is too easy. Everything is kind, kind of, we, we always delegate our problems to someone else. And uh, it seems like consequences will be nothing, but in reality, they are consequences and it could be pretty much severe. So Mark, tell us, about the structure and a greenhouse and um, your thoughts about it, please. Okay, um, <clears throat> my first thought on the concept of the greenhouse is really, when we talk about training, you know, I'll have the comment when I used to teach class and stuff like that, and kind of a joke, but you're leading people into it, you go, practice makes perfect, right? And you say it a couple times, yeah, practice makes perfect. And you go, no, perfect practice makes perfect. So in a sense, the environment in which you train and the methods through which you train, whether it be philosophical, martial arts, Qigong, the environment's got to be as real as possible, as close to reality as possible, so that you can practice not only executing correctly, but if you make mistakes, the pain and suffering of the wound or the, you know, the injury from making the mistake is something that you then have to process and deal with, because really, in a sense, it's through a certain level of suffering that we truly learn. So now, Master, a long time ago, you always used the term, the greenhouse, that we in the West live in a greenhouse. And in a sense is because life has become, or existence of life has become so relatively easy with advances in technology in higher civilization, whatever the, the rules are, a lot of times we are never truly exposed to the reality of nature. So not being exposed to the reality of nature, we never really pay the price in our actions or mistakes in our actions through valid consequences and we don't learn. Well, you can hear the term often, oh, it's a first world problem. You know, some silly thing that we can worry about in the luxurious confines of the West that have nothing to do with reality. So 
this greenhouse in which we live, which is a far cry from what nature displays as its principles, those on which our existence really is predicated, we're never exposed to. So we can go quite a long way in life never being exposed, much as the way people raise children today, what we call the helicopter parents, in the sense is you're always trying to protect the child from pain, you're always trying to protect the child from consequences, so they never have to learn. So here in the West, it's so comfortable living. I mean, yeah, you get a cut, you know, just go down to the hospital and get it stitched up. You don't have to worry about infection. You, you make mistakes in the social situation. Oh, you've got the police to fall back on just mistakes and decisions and dealing with people never have the consequences they would be uh, when life were harder. Back when it was only I had to worry about feeding and clothing and protecting myself from the other animals, life was real. It was black and white what was important. Now, as we become more insulated from the realities of nature, we can begin to think about things that aren't even real, just greenhouse theory. If you think about yin and yang, and actually the yin and yang symbol is the represent, representation of vouvet, which is non-interference, in many ways, living like this is much more comfortable, and you can argue that it's kind, but you can actually argue for our spiritual development and understanding of life, it's actually very cruel, and which would make sense because in yin and yang, we have opposites, so cruelty and kindness are part of the same continuum. So what society has done is it create this easy, comfortable place of existence where we don't have to worry so much or we never really have to pay the price. So we, in a sense, society is cruel to us through this kindness because we never really learn the price until it's too late. And then we make so many mistakes over so much time that eventually that final mistake we make is much closer to fatal. So because we're not bruised in the learning early on, we bleed badly when we make the mistakes finally in this greenhouse that the West basically is. Now we don't follow the nature, so we're never exposed to the principles, so we never learn to make correct actions. And that's dangerous to both our physical life and our spiritual life. Uh, the thing is, again, which uh, in our, let's call it, greenhouse society, uh, which I was totally shocked when I came to United States 47 years ago, believe it or not, it's uh, parents could say, could tell uh, children, go ahead, make a mistakes, make mistakes. Yeah, you learn through mistakes. And I was totally shocked because, of course, we all make mistakes. Yeah during our journey through life, of course, we are going to make mistakes. But to ask for troubles, basically, <laughs> this is ridiculous. You know, of course, we'll make mistakes and we'll learn through mistakes. But looking for, uh, for troubles, just looking for mistakes, this is, this, is, this is ridiculous. Come back again to my friend, police officer. There is only volunteers. You know, basically people putting themselves a lot of times in situations of danger, uh, reckless situation, uh, uh, and the desires of the mind come in full force. People cross highway, for instance, in their mind, they can be so quick. They can go through the line of the cars and uh, the solution comes in four seconds when they start or three, when they start to cross it. Yeah, the people who walk in a dark alley he thinks nothing will happen at all because not supposed to be happen. We'll pay the good price for that. We talk about that concept. The greenhouse is dangerous to the concept of spirituality. You know, and I go back again, Master, you had the greenhouse 30 years ago, but you remember when you used to ask us, what would be your perfect day? And that was that first attempt to start defining spirituality for us and how to lead a spiritual life, at least in the physical aspect, because you can't pursue all that, you know, emotional or non-visible action uh, until you really have a concrete definition of how to lead a spiritual life in the day to day. So, and that was how to have a perfect day. This modern society gives you you can have so many flights of fancy because you're going to be exposed to this book or that book that says what spirituality is. 
But really spirituality, the, the foundational definition has to start off in the day-to-day -day of our life, just what we do from day to day. And again, in this soft society, this greenhouse society, you can always have these cloudy definitions that don't work. And so spirituality in a harsher society, as back a native society, was more easily defined because it was by right action that gave you to get through the day that gave you that option to lead a spiritual life. Here, it can just be cloudy about it. But a good concrete spiritual definition on how to lead life day to day, you know, is, is a, it's almost impossible to define in the West without someone helping you clearly define it. It just isn't there. Sure, thank you, Mark. And of course, you need a teacher. You remember like three star gods. It's a god of health, god of teacher, and god of luck. So when three components go together, then person can have content life. So of course, without teacher, it's impossible. So now we'll come back again to the, to the part of how we live in a social structure, where we get information, how basically communicator communicate with us. Uh, through TV, through through the internet, basically we all programmed, programmed culturally, uh, psychologically, spiritually. So we program. So who is the programmer? What is the program? And I think Sam will tell us about that. So please, Sam. Thank you, Grandmaster. So the Grandmaster asked me to speak about the subject of reality versus social programming. And I'm going to start off by reading chap uh, the poem from chapter 15 in The Wisdom of Lao Tzu, by, translated by Lin Yu Tang. It's titled, The Wise Ones of Old. The wise ones of old had subtle wisdom and depth of understanding, so profound that they could not be understood. And because they could not be understood, perforce must they be so described. Cautious like crossing a wintry stream, irresolute like one fearing danger all around, grave like one acting as guest, self-effacing like ice beginning to melt, genuine like a piece of undressed wood, open-minded like a valley, and mixing freely like murky water. Who can find repose in a muddy world? By lying still, it becomes clear. Who can maintain his calm for long? By activity, it comes back to life. He who embraces this Tao guards against being overfull. Because he guards against being overfull, he is beyond wearing out and renewed. The first question you have to ask from this poem is why the excessive emphasis on being cautious, on being fearful, on being aware of what's around you. And the truth of the matter is in ancient societies, they were much more close to nature than we are in today's society. Consequences and actions had a much stronger link. Uh, and therefore the results of your actions had direct and swift consequences, probably to your own personal survival. And they were not as comfortable as we are in our modern day advanced Western society. Now let's talk about our current Western society as a starting point, because this is where we are now. As a difference, we currently go to supermarkets in order to get our food. We, don't know, we no longer have to hunt. We live in modern temperature controlled homes instead of tents or huts. We allow ourselves to be sedated by easy access to pleasures such as food, alcohol, drugs, and video games. Not that there's anything wrong with these things, but simply that it's, ex it's an excess. And the Romans had a saying, they called it bread and circuses, which is not really all that different from our society's focus on sports and entertainment. And what that basically meant was that you would give the masses entertainment and bread and food to keep them sedated so they didn't ask questions. They didn't actually challenge the social order. And on our, per, our current society, personal responsibility is taken away. Things are delegated. 
We have the police who we delegate our personal protection to. We have lawyers who we delegate our social affairs to in terms of taking care of that. Everything is delegated away from our own personal responsibility. And in virtually all other ancient societies, man was responsible for his own personal protection. And that is something that we don't do today. And in fact, if we do take responsibility for our own personal self-defense, oftentimes we experience negative social consequences from that. All of this con congregates to take away our own personal responsibility for our own actions. And this brings me to why we don't notice the conflict between our social programming and reality. Because if we had a strong connection to reality, we might wake up and say, ask some questions, but most people do not. So basically we now live in a society where there's a loose or no connection between our actions and our consequences. An example of this would be overprotective parents. I think one of the previous speakers said helicopter parents, which I think is a very, very good term for them. A little fact, Currently, 50% of young adults under the age of 30 live with their parents. And according to a report by Morgan Stanley that came out recently, most of those young adults, instead of using that opportunity to build their, res their financial resources to build a better life for themselves, they are instead fueling the luxury goods market. They're basically acting as though life is a party. And they're basically treating it as though it's a party that will go on forever. So a good metaphor for this is that these kids are plants in a greenhouse and you have to ask the question, what will happen when that greenhouse gets shattered or broken in some fashion? You know, what will happen when their parental protection disappears? I'm not certain it's going to be a good result. And even parents who are trying to do the right thing and teach their kids how to navigate society, develop children with good character, and strength of will and the ability to deal with conflict, those parents are still fighting an uphill battle against the programming that their children receive in school and the peer pressure that those kids get to conform to the society around them. These things create an issue with consequences and actions. It removes the link between the two. That's a situation where there's no consequences for their actions, but there are still delayed consequences even. There are a number of people in our society who engage in alcoholism, smoking, and substance abuse. These are things that they feel good at the time for the individual doing it. However, they will ultimately have negative consequences for their health, their relationships with their family, and greater society later on down the line. In ancient societies, if a person was to engage in self-destructive behavior, the consequences would have been swift. They would have been ostracized from society, and there would have been negative consequences possibly to their own personal survival. Now, let's analyze the social consequences of this situation. As a society, when there's this loose link between action and consequences, you're creating a generation of people who have weak character and who have little ability to deal with hardship and conflict, which as we know is part of life. You cannot get through life without encountering conflict and hardship. So not being able to deal with that is a problem. It also creates a mistaken belief that the world is an easy place, namely that it's a party. And as Peter Bloomfield sa said before, it's not a party, it's a hunt. These people end up with a lack of purpose and direction in their lives. That leads to confusion. And as we know as Taoists, confusion is the worst sin we can have as a Taoist. It also creates an unhealthy focus on the pleasures of life. Not that there's anything wrong with pleasures, but it's like having eating cake morning, noon, and night for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You know, there's no nourishment there. And then you end up with a population that is easily distracted and controlled by sports and entertainment, which, as I said before, are the bread and circuses of today. You also end up with a lack of emotional restraint and discipline which as the grandmaster pointed out, is one of the drivers of criminal behavior today. We're basically creating a culture of people who have weak character and who believe that they can simply get away with all of their mistakes. They have a lack of personal accountability and responsibility. Under these conditions, what would cause a person to actually seek a spiritual path since they either have no or minimal consequences for their actions? The answer to that is, they initially ask a question. 
I remember years ago, the grandmaster often told us that the difference between a spiritual person and a common person is a spiritual person starts to ask the question. And the reason you ask the question is because something in you has noticed a dichotomy between your actions that the society has programmed you do, to do and the consequences of those actions. A spiritual person has a more sensitive link between actions and consequences and will test what they see with reality. And this awareness can also be prompted by your, your hon soul. Now, as a definition here, we haven't talked about this yet. There are two sides to our soul. There's the hun soul, which is our prenatal awareness. And then there's our post soul, which is our postnatal awareness. These two combined, and, and basically our po is who we are now, our hun is who we were in a past life. And our hun might give us some intuition that perhaps we need to go in a certain direction. Also, something that will cause spiritual awareness, and this is often very common in our society, is people will have a personal trauma or disaster that has direct physical consequences to their lives. And so that becomes an issue. We once had a student who came to our school and he had studied in a martial art that did not require full contact. He basically had the experience of going into his basement with a friend of his and wanting to test what he had learned. He discovered that nothing that he had learned actually worked. And to his credit, he made the decision that he was going to find what did work. Another example of people who are, have a loose or tight action to consequence connection are millionaires. I have a friend who is a financial planner and I've talked to him a few times. And he's told me that there's a stark difference between people who have inherited their wealth versus people who have earned it. And you can notice a massive difference in the character between the two. Once an individual has started a spiritual path, how do they continue it? Because just starting on it isn't really the, the answer. Well, they have to have the personal strength to actually seek out their answers and not close their eyes to the consequences of their actions or the actions of others, because we can learn from other people's consequences as well. They have to exercise their prevailing intellect. And they have to take personal responsibility for their actions and exercise discipline. These qualities develop what's known as our posal, which is who we are now, which will hopefully take us through the test and to our next incarnation. So in summary, consequences are like gravity in our lives. The same way an astronaut's body will grow weak if they stay in space too long, an individual who is shielded from the consequences of their actions or inactions will have their character grow weak. So consequences are an important path to learning for a spiritual individual. Thank you very much, Sam, it's great. Yeah, it's a personal responsibility. Again, remember what was carved in front of the gates of every Taoist temple. Every man responsible for his own actions, which you can translate every man responsible for his own actions and consequences. We all have to really be very selective to see what's going on. If it's a basically program which we follow, is it desires of our mind or we're desires of our fantasies or it's what we want for contentment? Great, so for those questions, uh, we'll cover Greg. Thank you, Grandmaster. I wanted to talk a bit about the role of the family in society today because we're all sold the false propaganda that the key to happiness is this family unit, that uh, the American dream starts with getting married, having children, and that this is one of the keys to contentment in modern society. But the modern family structure is actually a perversion of what family was in the past. In ancient families throughout history, if you were born into a blacksmith family, you were trained as a blacksmith. You were apprenticed at the feet of your father or the elders who were blacksmiths, and you became part of that culture. You, were, you learned 
to operate a blacksmith shop. You learn the skills necessary and your survival and the survival of the family were one. Same thing if you were born into a warrior culture. For example, Mongol children, the Mongols took their children as soon as they could walk and they learned uh, immediately to ride a horse, shoot a bow, wield a sword because they became part of that warrior culture. And the ultimate survival of that culture depended upon these children immersing themselves in the culture of the family. But today's family has no such commonality, no such focus or purpose. Uh, the average family in the United States, for example, has two parents who both work away from the home. So these parents work 40, 50, maybe 80 hours a week individually, probably in different companies. And so their goals, professional goals, have nothing to do with the family. And because the family elders are away from the home, they take their children and put them in daycare where they're raised by strangers, again, with no commonality to that family. As the children get older, they go to a school system where they're taught by strangers and taught lessons that frankly may have nothing to do with the contentment of the family unit. And these children, as they get older in school, they too become extremely busy with their own schedules. 30, 40 hours a week in the schools, in the classroom, a couple of hours a night of homework, there's sports activities, social activities. And because they're with their friends and these other people, they, they have very little bond with their parents. They develop their own lives separate from the family life. It, it, it's actually a miracle sometimes if a family has one meal together over, over the course of a week. And this doesn't get better when the, when the family ages. The children typically would leave the home and maybe start, a, maybe start their own careers elsewhere. Lucky if they see their family once or twice a year, maybe on holidays. And this also affects the parents as the parents get older. Maybe now they've reached their retirement age. They think it's time for them to, to reap the benefits of all these years of working. But again, they're lucky if they see their children a couple of times, this investment of, of all their time and resources into the family unit, they're lucky if they even see their children when they get older. And sadly, when they become elderly, you know, the children don't have time because now they're running their own careers. They have their own family units. And so the elders are forced to, to fend for themselves, or in most cases, they end up being sent to a nursing home where they are cared for by strangers and sadly die amongst strangers. And people who their whole lives have accepted these artificial societal values, that family is the most important thing, come to the end of their existence realizing that it was all a lie. In fact, we're chasing a false contentment instead of the naturality of pursuing a commonality of, of goals with a core family unit the way it was supposed to be. Thank you, Grandmaster. Well, thank you, Greg. It's excellent. Very, very good point. In a family unit, in the relationships, uh, social relationships, one mistake when almost everybody does is thought that something could be changed. For instance, relationship between men and a woman. They meeting each other, men would think, well, that's pretty good. You know, that's what I was looking for in my life, but something I don't like. Few things I would, it's like a mechanism. I need a little screwdriver, I'll put a little bit, a couple of screws here, tighter, whatever it is. And I'll change the person. The woman thinks exactly the same. They say, well, this, this guy, you know, well, he's not perfect, but you know what? I'll train him, I restrained him, or, you know, I'm also going to have my little screwdriver and I'll fix this and I'll fix that. And that's what expectations. On the reality, again, modern psychology discovers that human personality builds totally cemented between five, seven years old. That's it. And after that, nothing could be changed. So let's come back again to, to the expectations. What you see, what you got, that's it. Nothing can be changed. 
the same like like uh, people in our congregations whatever students would come and i could see it's a serious person or it's a person who just basically just just uh, want to learn a little bit on the surface and then begun etc nothing you can change it's only one thing could be changed if person want to change himself herself whatever yeah that that's only one thing it's a it has to be incredible desire for individual to change it's only individual can do that and if we know that nothing could be changed that that's what that's what we got what we got that's it then expectation correct and then actions correct and consequence will be correct Mr. David Wright, professor, will tell us actually continue about expectations and good luck, bad luck, and structures, etc. Please, David. Thank you, Grandmaster. We've got uh, expectations and desires of the mind, which are kind of inextricably intertwined. That we are programmed by society, as one of our earlier speakers said, with uh, certain expectations about how things should be. And if we accept this unquestioningly, it's going to give us very many problems when it comes up against harsh reality that expectations and reality don't always correspond. Our tool for dealing with this, if we can employ it, is third eye, which is a technique of saying, I want to separate my own personal perspective and try to get an outside perspective. I wanna act as though I'm a little camera up on the ceiling and look at things, not from my personal desires of the mind, I'm wonderful, everything's great perspective and take it a harsh, yeah, and harsh is the word, look at reality from somebody, the point of view of someone who isn't me. This is an incredibly difficult thing to do. I mean, it's hard enough to try to look at the world and break through the programmed expectations that we have and the desires of the mind that things be in a certain way and to break through that and say, no, the, we have this wake and join the hunt. We have harsh reality. We have the fact that we're being fed bread and circuses and to break away from that and say, no, that is not an accurate view of reality. But even accepting that is much harder than trying to take third eye view of ourselves and this is uh the third eye actually comes at us from two different directions there's the what do we think of ourselves where we're the heroes of our own story and we're suave and debonair and smart and funny and everybody wants to be our best friend and the sad reality that we're probably not and not to say that we are awful people, but to say that we are always the heroes of our own story and our own thinking and getting away from that is very, very difficult. And this shows up in particular when we're dealing with other people. When we go to deal with other people, as was already mentioned, that you think, well, this person's pretty nice, but if only I could change them, and of course we can't. But suppose you're in a business dealing and you're trying to make a deal with somebody else. You'd like them to see everything your way. You're just trying to sell them something. You want them to see it your way. What you have is fantastic. They should just accept everything you say. And the fact is, they probably won't. And you have to use this other application of third eye to say, not so much, what do you look like in reality, but what do you look like to this other person? How do they see you? And this is going to be colored, granted by superficial things many times. How do you dress? If you go into a bank and you see the person behind the counter is wearing a ripped t-shirt, dirty shorts, and has a three-day growth of beard, you are not going to be impressed by this bank. It does not meet your expectations. Now, maybe the person behind the counter is a fine human being, but they don't look like what you expect. The bank is not going to last long if they try to work like this. And so this is where we get into the additional notion of camouflage, that societal expectations. We don't have to buy into them. We can recognize how artificial they are, but we are in the middle of them regardless. And if we want our path through the world to be as smooth as we can make it, we have to know what that person sitting across the table from us is expecting. What do they see 
And what do they expect to see in order to feel comfortable in the situation where the two of you now exist? And so camouflage sounds like cheating. It sounds like lying. And in a sense, it is. But it's also a mechanism for smoothing things, for making people comfortable, and for making your life more comfortable. The, the key here point about camouflage is not that you have to buy into society's beliefs and values, all the stuff that's being pumped at you by the communicator. You have to, but you have to know what they are. And you have to know how to adapt to them so that you can work with other people in a way that doesn't maximize friction. It's all very well to say, I'm a rebel. I'm not going to conform to this. And that's your privilege. But it's going to make your life incredibly difficult in many cases. And really, it's not necessary. I think the, the mindset that says, well, I don't want to conform is part of what's seeing, OK, these values are artificial and I don't want to follow them. But there's a difference between saying, I know they're artificial and I don't believe in them, and saying, I know they're artificial and I'm not going to follow them. That you, you want to have a clear picture of reality, but that doesn't mean that you have to go over out and tip over all the chairs. I think that's our, our adaptation. That's, that is the word here, that you're adapting to the reality around you because it's a lot bigger than you and you can't change it. You can let it run over you, or you can smoothly move to the side and let it miss you. Thank you. Thank you, David. This is great, actually. Yeah, yeah adaptation, that's one of those major keys to contentment. If we don't adapt, we just will perish. That's it. There's no other way. It's only part of adaptation on just perish. That's it. It's evolve or dissolve. Like Mr. Lafarge used to say. <laughs> we talk about the about teachings of Tao. Sometimes uh, people who actually read Tao the Ching and like a, a few days ago, um, I spoke with one gentleman who read it actually and uh, he used to be a teacher and I was totally shocked when at this intelligent human being said well i'm so shocked that nature is unkind wow so i just told him again listen just watch national geographic that's it and that's all your answer is there all right so, so it is kind or unkind but it's really shocking that that man in his uh, 40s early 50s still still think are we part of the nature or we above the nature or and shouldn't be so unkind, etc. So it's kind of it's a gloomy picture of real. Reality is real, but kind of gloomy. Well, it's not gloomy, it's reality. That's it. That's what it is, what it is. Mr. Lafarge, can you enlighten us a little bit about optimism of Taoist teachings? Thank you, sir. Yes, you use this phrase often, uh, optimism of Taoism, and Many people who don't study the Tao or who are who maybe read it, they are shocked and dismayed by a lot of the principles of the Tao. Nature is unkind, non-interference. But actually, it's the perspective that you have looking at these, these principles that will determine whether you see them in the correct light or not. So part of what we're doing is preparing for death. On the, in this life, life is a test, and we're preparing for that ultimate departure eventually. When it comes, we're we're all mortal and mortal unexpectedly, so we have to put things in the right perspective. And by thinking about death, you can have it become a very depressing thing and, and affect you in a very negative way if you think about death, or you can avoid thinking about death, or you can say to yourself, "Death is coming." My time is very limited. I don't know how much time I have here on earth. So I'm going to make every moment and make it a precious moment and make it a useful moment and use it to evolve. Because if you spend all your life sitting on your couch and watching TV and playing video games, you're just squandering the currency that you've been given in life. But if you take it and use it to 
improve yourself, to improve your intellect, to understand reality better, to understand yourself better, then when that ultimate time comes, and who knows when that is, when you pass on, you have something you can take with you, a legacy, not a legacy that you've left behind some business or some painting or something like that, but a legacy of all of your actions and consequences by putting life in the proper perspective that we have a short amount of time here. So don't waste it. Do what is right for you. We have to pay our taxes to some degree to society and other things. So we have to do these banal things, whether it's go to work, do family ceremonies and whatnot. But don't put all of your all of don't put all your chips towards those activities because ultimately they're not going to enhance your life when you move on. So we really just have to look at things clearly see reality clearly and yes they can be harsh but life isn't a day at the beach life is hard nature is unkind so if we look at things through the right lens of reality we can take the right actions and have the right consequences in this very very short life again we we touching art of adaptation and uh this moment we should be brutally brutally honest to ourselves so using the third eye that's what previous speaker said uh, using art of adaptation trying to understand as close as possible our limitations and trying to get to read of desires of the mind and other fantasies that's the step to contentment and that's what we want this is life is a test uh, that was how Kim has said, what is the purpose of life? Right? It's a test. But this test, we have to walk, like again, like very carefully, like crossing the, the winter, winter spring, actually, very, very carefully. That's why Dao De Ching is a book of warnings, again. Yes, we'll make mistakes, but we don't have to look for, for mistakes. Another warning, how to avoid the problems, unnecessary problems, and what is the cause of the problems? There is a, we human being is a microcosmos, and there is a macrocosmos. So there is a frequency of this micro and macro. And as long as we have a good frequency, it's like radio station. You drive your car and you can hear the music, then you turn around to the next street, and your frequency is not as strong. Your connection is not as good. So now you can't hear the music. So the higher energy cannot hear confused person. Confused person doesn't know exactly what's going on, what, what, what his place in the world, what his desires really. It's uh, what he, how, how's his art of adaptation, sometimes almost zero. So that's about this vibration macrocosmos microcosmos and i'd like to master master rick will tell us about that please rick thank you grandmaster confusion is defined as the worst sin in Taoism, as we've spoken about before and each person is born under a certain chinese astrological sign and this time of birth represents a specific configuration of the stars in the celestial cosmos. As such, a person's chi energies and the lines of, of energy in their body are an imprint of this celestial configuration at the time of their birth. So that's the reason why the astrological sign is kind of hooked to this person by the time of their birth. As a result of this, each person's vital energy or chi has a frequency. The frequency is associated with the specific configuration of the stars at the time of their birth. This configuration creates channels of cosmic energy that align from the stars to this individual person. Throughout their life, the great ultimate basically sends celestial chi energy to the person. And this affects their mental and physical health 
and ultimately their fate and destiny. The clearer someone is and the less confused they are, the more aligned their frequencies are to the great ultimate. As the master spoke, confusion is the biggest sin in Taoism, and it's known that internal confusion or the lack of contentment in one's life affects the frequency of their vibration. If someone is discontent in their life, their frequency of qi is barely vibrating. So the connection to the great ultimate, to the celestial cosmos, is very weak. The idea is that this lack of contentment in our life creates an energetic stagnation, and it affects our mental and physical health. Many times, people follow societal stereotypes, as, as some of the other speakers spoke about, because they're programmed to do so, and they believe that they are doing uh, noble things. This internal conflict, many times, between what is expected from these societal stereotypes and our actual contentment, many times, can clash. So... The common man, many times, is content with following societal stereotypes, and they don't have an issue. If someone is more sensitive in their life, it may be that following these societal stereotypes creates an internal discontentment in their life. This discontentment creates a weak chi vibration and basically can affect the person's mental and physical health. The only way to correct this is to break the societal stereotype that we were programmed with. It's very difficult, but the person must make a change in their life. And then when they break the societal stereotype and make this change, and then contentment can result, then their vibration of chi frequency starts to move again. Their connection with the great ultimate gets stronger. And this affects their mental and physical health and well-being. By breaking the societal stereotype and doing what's right for them as an individual, this creates a stronger vibration of their chi and a healthier vibration. In the case of misalignment, if the person following the traditional Chinese ideas of the psychosomatic aspect of disease. If a person is discontent and unhappy with their life, after a certain amount of time, this blockage of mental channels can actually manifest as a physical disease. And this physical disease can ultimately even result in their death. Perhaps an example will help to exemplify what we're talking about, about breaking societal stereotypes to get rid of this illusion of contentment. Many years ago, we spoke to someone who was married for a number of years, probably like 20 years, and they were very discontent in their life, and they, they weren't happy with their family life and with their wife. And at the time, when we spoke to this person, we said, why don't you get divorced? You know, find someone that you're happy with and, and seek contentment in your life. And what they said was, you know, I'm not going to give my house to this woman. I'm not going to give all my money to this woman. Uh, you know, I'm not going to create chaos in my life. And then they went along for a number of years until they retired. And then when they finally retired and they spent 24-7 at home in this discontent atmosphere, they, they couldn't deal with it anymore. Being discontent in this atmosphere, their frequency of chi vibration was barely vibrating. Their connection and rejuvenation with the energy of the celestial cosmos was almost nil, right? This creates a circumstance where the person feels weak and depressed and has lack of energy. After a while, this person couldn't take it anymore. They finally broke the societal stereotype that they grew up with about the stigmas of divorce and got divorced. And after that, they did find someone, they, they reconnected with someone that they were very happy with, and their whole life rotated to some kind of content existence. And as a result of this, the frequency of chi also started to vibrate again. 
the person was healthy and they were content with their life. They weren't depressed anymore. But it takes a lot of strength to break these societal stereotypes if you feel this internal discontent. Confusion is one of the biggest sins in Taoism. Discontentment is also a sin in that it affects your frequency of chi and your connection to the great ultimate. If you're confused and discontented in your life, this definitely affects your actions. And if your actions aren't correct and in alignment with nature, and if you're not happy with yourself and your lot in life, then this will affect your actions and ultimately your consequences. Exactly right. That's what it is, Rick. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Confusion, again, like we said, it's the a, it's a biggest scene in, in our Taoist philosophy and theology. It can go the, either way. It also can go in a way like person does right things. Like we meet a lot of people who do right things. The person has a house and has a family and the two children and a dog, golden retriever, you know, and everything is fine. And he works like a, like a 50, 60 hours a week and then come home and work home, you know, rebuilding kitchen or, or working on the basement, et cetera. And the neighbor said, what a good guy. You know, what a, what, a, what a terrific family man and how's everything fine. And a person not happy at all because it's like uh, Greg explained to us, institutional family, he kind of sensed it. The children, yeah, they kind of there, but they're not there. Yeah, you walk in your, in your apartment and I can see it's like my, my daughter, door is locked. I can, I can hear she, she's on the phone, on the internet. Sometimes she, she even didn't come to eat because of no time. And I work the same time, 50 hours, 60 hours a week. And the uh, conversation was the same. How are you? How's everything in school? Good, good. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> so uh, the individual can do everything what society asks him or her to do. This is it. It's like a perfect life, but not happy. Is still not happy. And then psychosomatic aspect comes again. Diseases and depression and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. When I was looking for houses, actually, it was a real estate lady. She said, Well, on this street now, she said, we live with my husband. She was in her late 60s. And I said, Oh, that's very nice. Well, she said, I have three children, they gone. This is it. Now me and my husband, we can live normal life. <laughs> That's what she said. So basically she did, she, she paid her dues to society. And now around 70 years old, she is ready for contentment. So anyway, the confusion can take different forms, uh, the, the different shapes, and it still would be detrimental to our mental and physical health. So we're coming back again to our actions. Whatever we do, whatever our third eye show us to do, it will be consequences. And sometimes it will be severe. So we were talking about actions, mm -hmm. but actually inaction should be considered as an action too. Because many people might think that if they are not doing something, that it's okay. And for example, when we're talking about our physical health. So if a person do not do uh, regular exercises or follow more or less healthy uh, food, so the consequences also will be. Yes, Alex, yeah, you can call it inaction or action which is stagnated. Stagnation, that's the whole thing. Let's call it stagnation. Action is still something which something is moving, something active, whatever it is, right or wrong, it's, 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 it is action. But non-action, it's just a stagnation. And maybe sometimes we go through the period of stagnations in our life, 
it's like walking through the woods. You know, we're going here and there, there, there is a folk or this is, this, is, this is darkness, whatever it is. But we should still have to have a flashlight and go through, seeing where we're going. We shouldn't really just walk at night. That's why, again, confusion is like walking at night through the woods. If you don't have a light, you, you, you'll get to the hole and break your leg or a branch will, will, will cut your face, your eye, whatever it is. So you're not going to, you're not going to walk a long time if, 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 if you basically, if you know, darkness, darkness is a confusion. So for better understanding, again, in action, action, in action, in action, it's a basically just, just in action. That's it. Exactly. But yeah. it consequences will be also severe. Yeah, stagnations, it's also the, the scene. Yeah, it's, and again, we all go through the period of gray, gray territory. There's no doubts about. But because everything is still like a yin and yang, like black and white, we still have to cross this line between as fast as possible. Yeah, during our journey in life, yes, we, we see the gray territory. And, but we should know have to pass it as fast as possible. So there's a stagnation actually for better definition is stagnation versus action. Then it's so much more clear. <laughs> How's it now? Perfect. Thank you, Grandmaster. <laughs> Great. You're welcome. In, anybody wants to say something or ask something? Peter, it to you. Uh, no, I, I just thought that was a great point that in what you said that inaction is actually also an action. So uh, I didn't think of it like that. So that was a good point. Well, it's actually Alex said it as uh, our Lutvenian member of congregation <laughs> as his line. Let's give him a credit. Okay, yeah. you got it. <laughs> Choosing not to act is in fact an action, Yeah. right? True, because stagnation is basically rattling. That's the whole thing. Yeah, action is still moving. Yeah, it's uh, uh, we uh, we could be. Uh, you remember the great line what Lao Tzu said? Actually, sometimes it's like a corpse, and sometimes jump like a dragon. Right. So in action, actually, it's a it's when we we reserve energy. When we reserve energy, that's a healthy inaction. If we're just rattling. It's stagnation. Yes. Sir. Again, we should we should, we should should be very clear with any situations with ourselves. Like I, as I said before, brutally honest. That's it. You see, and when we feel any chance to get a confused, we just have to take our spiritual sword and cut it off. So, in Taoist terms, inaction is actually action in the right time. We reserve our power and we act in the right time. That's correct, Master Rick. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Versus stagnation. Yes, versus stagnation. What do you want to say, Mark? Yeah, we make the. I think we make the point. I think in the draft uh, of the book that we're working on, that in a sense, vuve or the proper alignment of ourselves with vuve action in the right time is really wisdom because really making the right decisions in life is where wisdom is reflected in the action. So whether I act or not act, if I'm doing exactly the right thing I should be doing in that moment, then that's really, that's, that's wisdom. We can communicate that. That's true. But let's not forget that the way is actually non-interference. Yes. That's the very important moment when we should understand non-interference. A lot of times we're basically doing things which we shouldn't. We're going to the place where we don't belong. You see, we're not alert enough. Again, I'll come back to my uh, policeman friend. There's no victims, only volunteers. You see, it's a desire of the mind comes all the time. Like his story about uh, the young woman who who was living a uh, half drunk uh, club, a nightclub, and security guard offered her to walk her to the car, and she said with a great confidence, "How oh, I can take care of myself." We all hear it from different people. 
because a lot of times that's worth saying in a kind of hope, in words, as we all know, that nothing gonna happen. 15 minutes later, they found poor woman beaten up, raped, and et cetera, et cetera. How she, she wanted to take care of herself, we don't know. Maybe she thought she is a super ninja, or she had like a five gun, 45 caliber, whatever it is. But that, that's a lot of times we can hear again in our green, greenhouse society, sayings, brave, brave sayings. I can take care of myself, I can do this and I can do that. And they really hope that nothing happened. That's, that's the whole thing. Modern, modern karate or modern uh, self-defense systems, self-satisfaction for peaceful intellectuals. It was very interesting kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we cover a lot and we cover a lot, but it's still a tip of the iceberg because about actions and consequences, we can talk forever, not like hour and a half because everything and anything touch action and consequences. But at least we touch few important parts and I hope it was very useful. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. 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 Thank you.